So it's a tradition that uh, I deliver a lecture. It's really the highlight of the whole semester. <laughs> Before I do, let's take a moment and uh, offer a word of prayer, particularly for those in Houston area and for our brothers and sisters at uh, our sister institutions there in the Houston area who are suffering at this point. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up our fellow believers at uh, Houston Baptist and other area sister universities and pray for your care for them and pray for your watch care over them for their safety. We lift up the city of Houston and the area around Houston. We pray for the rains to cease, for the rescues to be successful. We pray for their relief. Watch over them, care for them, enable good things to come from even these tragic times. You're a good God and we love you and we trust you in the name of Jesus, amen. Shalom. Of all of my hopes for you this year, success, joy, victory, wisdom, I'm praying for you, your shalom, completeness, contentment, wholeness, peace. As I age, each new year fills me with nostalgia so that amidst the excitement of new and returning students, syllabi, social clubs, collegiate sports, I often find myself reflecting on my own experiences so long ago, reflecting and contrasting. When I was a freshman in college, for example, the President of the United States had just halted grain supplies to Russia and the U.S. Olympic Committee had voted to boycott the Moscow Summer Olympics game in Russia. Why? Because Russia had invaded Afghanistan. Today, the United States is increasing its troops being sent to Afghanistan. When I started my freshman year in college, the hostage crisis was in full bloom and there was talk of full-scale war with Iran. A new Republican president had just defeated his Democratic opponent, and corruption of public office holders was well known and documented. Operation Abscan had just indicted 30 officials for public corruption, including six congressmen and one senator. Public confidence in elected officials was at an all-time low, and many lamented that America's best days were past. Today, I hear many of the same laments. The year I began college was a year of international unrest, net national anxiety, and angst. The year I enrolled in college was also the year that I began to understand the dream that Martin Luther King Jr. was not yet realized. It was the year of my rude awakening about race. It was the beginning of a lifelong education about race relations, an education that continues today. One of my best friends in college was black, and one night we were eating at a local restaurant when I became aware that the waitress was intentionally ignoring us, serving others who had come in after us. I became very irritated, and when my friend noticed, he cautioned me. He cautioned me to never offend a person who handled my food. <laughs> there in that dive of a burger joint, I saw my friend and his reality with a whole new perspective and my heart dropped. It was as if scales had suddenly dropped off my eyes and I saw for the first time what was happening. She was intentionally behaving this way precisely because he was black. And it dawned on me that what was new and offensive and so troubling to me was nothing out of the ordinary for my buddy. And so began a deeper set of conversations the two of us had. And so began a greater awareness of the realities around me when it came to race and race relations. The year I began college was a year not unlike this year is for students today. One full of anxiety and political intrigue. 
personal hope, and even some angst. A new academic year begun in a world of social unrest, including a time of great divisions and tears in our social fabric. Sadly, these tears are still evident in our race relations. As far as we seem to have come on so many fronts, there is this tragic reality that we still have so much to do when it comes to race relations in our country, in our churches, in our university, in our homes. I didn't have the vocabulary at the time, but what was missing then is missing still. Shalom. As we commence another year of study together, I want us to focus our attention on the hard work of racial reconciliation. I know some may argue that this problem will never be solved and that focusing on such difficult subjects only exacerbates the problem. And to those who question why, I want to be absolutely clear. I categorically reject the notion that this, that this subject is too difficult to solve or that we should ignore the subject because it focuses and because too much focus exacerbates the problem. We must address this because reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We cannot ignore this because we're called to be ministers of reconciliation. We are called to address this because we are Christian scholars equipped and prepared to think through, work through, and lead through the hard issues of our day. Furthermore, it is incumbent upon us to speak out when events unfold, such as those that occurred recently in Charlottesville, Virginia. We must not equivocate, either as Christians or as Baptists. We must always be clear. We reject white supremacy as unchristian, anti-gospel, and antithetical to the Word of God. We echo the words of ERLC Ethics and Religious Commission President Russell Moore, who wrote, White supremacy does not merely attack our society, though it does, and the ideals of our nation, though it does. White supremacy attacks the image of Jesus Christ himself. White supremacy exalts the creature over the creator, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against it. This sort of ethnic nationalism and racial superiority ought to matter to every Christian, regardless of national, ethnic, or racial background. After all, we are not our own, but are part of a church, a church made up of all nations, all ethnicities, united not by blood and soil, but by the shed blood and broken body of Jesus Christ." End of quote. We must remind ourselves of the message of reconciliation and unity found in the gospel. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15, uh, 16 through 21, we read, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Dr. Norman reminded us in his Hobbes lecture in 2014, and I quote, Reconciliation with God brings reconciliation with one another. You cannot have one without the other. In fact, the biblical witness is that the reality of reconciliation with God is demonstrated by the reality of reconciliation among his people. Racial barriers, Stan wrote, and hostilities are a festering wound in the body of Christ. The perversion of both active and passive racism must be confronted and removed." End of quote. Because we are a university charged with thinking, charged with scholarship, charged with leading, it is incumbent upon us to work through these issues. Walter Storff described a college as the place where disciplined study is at the center of its project, but where shalom and the delight that is found in right relationships energizes our work. 
He writes, a college is a school, and as such, it places discipline study at the center of its project, but the lure of shalom will direct and energize it. The goal of the Christian college, so I have begun to think, he wrote, is to promote that mode of human flourishing, which is shalom, end of quote. As a university, we must speak out on these issues because they are matters of great import and relevance for our culture. We must speak to these issues because we promote that mode of human flourishing, which is shalom. But because we are a Baptist university, because we are a Southern Baptist university, we are especially accountable for speaking out on this particular issue. When an individual or a group has committed a particular sin, there is a commiserate burden. Given the Southern Baptist Convention's founding, its particular sins of racism in the past, the convention and its entities and organizations carry the added weight of responsibility for speaking out often and repeatedly against racism. Not just because it's right, not just because it's needed, but because we as Southern Baptists bear particular responsibility for it. Pete Menares challenges Christian universities seeking to be more racially and ethnically inclusive, writes, this inclusive model for the kingdom has practical implications for spiritual formation, chapel programming, and leadership. Looking to the future, he asks, will the Christian college be directed and energized by the lure of shalom? And will it seek the shalom of the individuals and places it serves? My answer to his question is yes. The Christian university must seek the shalom of the individuals and places it serves. So what does that mean for us as believers in general? And what might that mean for us as a distinctively Christian or Baptist university? Returning to Dr. Norman's lecture, he reminded us, we are people of redeemed words, redeemed feelings and passions, redeemed thinking and redeemed actions. As a Christian university, OBU is to reflect the reality of the kingdom of Jesus. OBU must be a place where the ideals of Jesus are lived, taught, declared, and practiced. As a kingdom university, OBU should be a place where the power of the gospel transforms enemies into neighbors, where those who speak, look, and act differently are transformed into brothers and sisters. So I believe that as Christ followers, as people of redeemed words, redeemed feelings and passions, redeemed thinking and redeemed actions, we must continue to speak out on issues of racism when it rears its ugly head. When Nazi, neo-Nazi, and white supremacist groups march and demonstrate, we must clearly condemn such groups. But posting on social media is insufficient. Posting on social media is often the extent of lazy activists who falsely believe that 140 characters is somehow equivalent to action and personal responsibility. It isn't. Speaking out should be followed with actions. And for the Christian, that begins in the church and in the local community and in the home. Jarvis Williams, in removing the stain of racism, offers 15 exhortations related to removing the stain of racism from the Southern Baptist Convention, and they're good starting points particularly for Southern Baptists to consider as we begin to think through our responsibilities. I'm going to summarize them very briefly. Number one, be quick to listen and slow to speak on race when we do not understand the issues. Spend more time listening instead of trying to speak to, at, about, for black and brown brothers and sisters. Pray for and support multi-ethnic church plants in our cities and communities. Stop making excuses for why our denomination still has the stain of racism. Stop limiting the racial reconciliation discussions to the black versus white divide in our convention. There are other, many other, gifted and underrepresented minority groups in Southern Baptist life. The movement of gospel-centered racial reconciliation within the SBC does not need an African-American savior, an Asian savior, a Latino savior, or a white savior. We need a multiracial partnership of churches working together. Enlarge our ethnic circles to include more black and brown believers. 
recognize that black and brown people can minister to white people and teach them many things about many subjects, including race. Understand that black and brown Southern Baptists need white allies in the work of gospel ministry. Understand that the kingdom of God does not revolve around whiteness or blackness or brownness. Recognize that whiteness is not normal and everything else abnormal. Neither the vast majority of the world's population nor the vast majority of those who still need to hear and respond to the gospel are middle class white Americans. Do not claim to view all people in a colorblind fashion. Black, brown, white, and everyone else in the convention must acknowledge our differences and pursue love, unity, and reconciliation in the gospel in spite of our differences. Do not play the race card just to serve a political agenda, to get television appearances, to increase Twitter followers, to gain more friends on Facebook, or get invites to the big white or brown or black conferences. To gain credibility in black and brown contexts on matters of gospel reconciliation, we must befriend black and brown people lacking celebrity status. Recognize that the evangelical movement generally, and the SBC specifically, still lack credibility with many black and brown communities, in part because of our historic failures to do all of the things already mentioned. And finally, he says, Black and brown Southern Baptists are not off the hook. Black and brown Southern Baptist churches need to be more diverse and inclusive as well. Writing the message of racial reconciliation in the gospel is a universal message for all people throughout the world who claim the name of Jesus Christ. The authors in that same book also caution us against easy fixes, including simply defining or thinking of racial reconciliation as simply diversity. Williams and Jones write, to define racial reconciliation as simple, simply diversity is misleading. The gospel includes both entry language, repentance and faith, justification by faith, and reconciliation with God, and maintenance language, walking in the spirit, reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles, and loving one another in the power of the spirit. End of quote. I think, too, that those of us from predominantly white American culture have much to learn about the concept of corporate identity. In this sense, we are very unlike most of the rest of the world around us. I want you, if you're white American, not to lose me at this point. We understand the world largely from an individualistic, highly personal worldview. The concept of being identified with and within a larger group or culture is very foreign to, to most of us. And because of this, white American culture struggles mightily with the concept of corporate responsibility and the concept of systemic racism or systemic evil. Permit me a lengthier quote because Tim Keller has in his essay, Racism and Corporate Evil, gotten to the core of this issue. He writes, in Romans 5, Paul goes way beyond the idea that you are responsible for what other members of your family did, and he goes way beyond the idea that you're responsible for what other members of your culture do. He says, you're responsible and you're condemned for what your ancestors Adam and Eve did. That is, just by virtue of being in the entire human race, you're responsible for things you didn't individually do. You're condemned for what they do. And then, of course, he turns around and says, but by connection to Jesus Christ, you can be saved, not because of what you've done, but through your connection to him by faith. The whole structure of the gospel is based on corporate responsibility. Keller says, if you really want to go all the way down and say, I'm only responsible for what I have done and only what I have done, there is no gospel. At the very heart of Protestant understanding, salvation ends up being corporate. It's not something we earn. It's something that comes to us by being joined with Christ. But our sin is there, not just because, of course, we do sin ourselves, but because we're sinful and condemned because of being part of the human race. 
at the very, very heart of the Bible, at the heart of theology, not just what the Bible says about you and your family, not just what the Bible says about you and your culture, but what the Bible says about you and the human race, how sin happens, how salvation happens, there is corporate responsibility. To some degree, Western people and white people in particular don't realize to what degree they filter out all kinds of things the Bible says. They just don't see them or they resist them because of that individualism. It's not biblical. It's not gospel. Furthermore, he writes, let's talk then about systemic evil. Here's what I mean by systemic, he says. If you're part of a community, there are systems that the whole community participates in. Things get done by the system, and you, by participating in the community, are to some degree getting that done. You might be in the community and know exactly what the system is doing and be very happy for it and actively doing it. Or you might be kind of knowing what happens in the system, and you don't think too much about it, but you're generally in favor of it. Or you know what's happening, but you don't do anything to stop it. Or you don't really know what's happening, and you don't care, and you don't even care to try to find out about it. Take for the example, he said, the Holocaust. At the top of the system, at the most responsible, you had the people who had set up the death camps. Underneath that, you had the guards and the people who were in the death camps who were following orders. Underneath that, you had people in town, civic leaders, who know what's happening there, but they really don't want to know. And then you go down to the citizen, the German citizen, who had heard rumors but they didn't want to know and didn't do anything about it and just paid their taxes and worked. At the one end, you've got people who are more corporately responsible. At the bottom, a little less corporately responsible. But all those people died because the whole system was working and everybody was in the system. Everybody who wasn't resisting the system was part of it because the system couldn't kill all those people unless everybody was doing their job, even just looking the other way. I share this lengthy quote because it gets to the heart of one of the biggest failures of American Christianity, particularly white American Christianity a failure to understand this biblical perspective of corporate responsibility. Because of our rugged individualism and our love for the priesthood of the believer as opposed to the priesthood of believers, we carry in Protestantism a bent toward an unhealthy understanding of autonomy. And in doing so, we, we often miss the obvious when talking about issues of systemic problems when it comes to race and society. I share this quote also to suggest that beyond the starting points, those 15 suggestions offered by Williams, that we as a university must begin to look at our own systems and structures openly and honestly. Outside of that, I don't have a set of fully developed answers. I'm convinced that we must use the creative skills, talents, and intellectual gifts that God has granted us as a community of scholars to work together towards solutions that foster shalom. I believe those 15 suggestions offered by Williams are good starting points, but I do believe there are three additional specific areas where we must focus attention within our own university committee, uh, community, academically. Academically, we've made great strides in diversifying our faculty and professional staff, but more must be done. This will require renewed efforts to enlarge our searches and proactively reach into ethnically and racially diverse communities. And we must consider ways in which we can provide, and su uh, provide support and encouragement for an increasingly diverse faculty and student body. Toward that end, I challenge our faculty Re-examine your own cultural biases to determine whether you have unintentionally disregarded or ignored scholarship, historical or contemporary, in your field of study due to systemic prejudice or outright overt exclusion of minority scholarship. I wonder, for example, how many of our courses have systemic bias and therefore ignorance built in and marvelous history completely ignored because it doesn't fit the prevailing narrative. I remind us, we are academicians, 
And I remind us that all truth is God's truth and that we're not afraid of truth because as Christian scholars, we know truth and truth has a name. His name is Jesus. Socially, socially we have much work to do. I find it encouraging as I looked over some preliminary statistics of our student body that we are over in our student body 30% racially and ethnically diverse. However, we have much work to do when it comes to leadership opportunities and social opportunities on our campus. Our Student Government Association and our social clubs and organizations are simply not reflective of our student body and diversity. This is an indictment. Honest evaluations are necessary to examine why. We must give each other the freedom to have open discussions as to what is stopping or limiting the ability or preventing the feelings of invitation or inclusion to greater diversity within our students' social life. At a personal level, we can all engage socially as well. Part of our calling as brothers and sisters in Christ is to love one another. Yet too often, we don't even get to know one another. And the more different we appear to be, the more difficult it might seem to be to get to know one another. But we're missing out on rich and deep and meaningful relationships with each other when we let mere skin tone and ethnic background limit our friendships and relationships. The world is a much lovelier place and a place where shalom is most deeply felt when we open our hearts to genuinely love one another, fellowship with one another, and enjoy one another. Culturally, culturally we have a mandate in our mission statement to engage a diverse world. Several years ago, I challenged the Faculty and Spiritual Life Office to significantly grow our cultural engagement. Specifically, I reissue that challenge anew. One of the ways to, one of the ways to prepare a well-educated graduate who is more fully self-aware and more fully human is to expose them to diverse cultures. A student who travels to another country is a better informed and more mature believer and citizen. I so desire that every OBU student either study abroad or participate in a global mission or service trip to the extent that faculty and deans can lead in these efforts to incorporate such experiences in the curriculum, I support and applaud those efforts. To the degree that faculty can promote existing programs and work with spiritual life and global outreach, our global outreach team here at OBU, I encourage you to do so even more. And I pledge to work with our faculty and deans and our study abroad team to develop many more new international student study programs over the next few several years, the next two years specifically, so that your opportunities as, student, as students are greater. Culturally, we must also learn to celebrate when we get things right. As Southern Baptists, we haven't always gotten it right in the past, but we seek to get it right now and in the future. We need to find ways to celebrate the accomplishments of all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of skin tone or national origin. Our students need role models who look like them. And so we must find opportunities to celebrate pioneers who blaze trails here on Bison Hill. That's why we celebrate great men like Dr. Eric Mays, who was the first African-American graduate of OBU. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in 1963 he co-organized One Church, One Child Adoption of Oklahoma. He served as a member of the Board of Directors of the National Baptist Convention as a treasurer at the state level. He was a member of the Baptist Ministers Association of Oklahoma City and the first president of Concerned Clergy for Spiritual Renewal. Dr. Mays was a great man and a tremendous leader of whom OBU is most proud. He is a pioneer most worthy of emulating and celebrating. Our students need to know our stories and our people, and that's why we celebrate people like Sunday Ofadulu, who received his degree from OBU in 1964 after, his, after watching his older two brothers die in Nigeria of sickle cell anemia. 
His dream was to come to America to study medicine and discover a treatment for the deadly disease, and he was accepted by OBU. After, after completing his degree and going on to complete his doctorate at OU, he went on to obtain the patent for the treatment of sickle cell anemia and serve on the faculty of Texas Southern University. When he received an honorary doctorate from OBU in 2000, on this very stage, he reminded students, God has a purpose and a plan for everybody. And he challenged OBU students, I want you to come back here and encourage the next generation. Sunday Fadulu is a pioneer whose life is worthy of emulating. We have much culturally to celebrate, and like Dr. Fadulu, we want all of our students, every one of you, to find and fulfill God's purpose and plan for your life. And we want you to come back and encourage the next generation. We want you, while you are here and after you leave, to seek and find shalom. At OBU, we seek shalom. It is at the root of who we are. OBU is a distinctively Christian university that transforms lives by, by equipping students to pursue academic excellence, integrate faith with all areas of knowledge, engage a diverse world, and live worthy of the high calling of God in Christ. In seeking shalom, we own up to the failures of the past. We, je we reject outright the wrongs in our present state. And in the context of our message today, we reject the ungodly evil vestiges of racism. We confront areas in our lives, in our institutions, and in our own university where we find systemic bias and prejudice. We pledge to be patient with one another as we have frank and open discussions, allowing each other to make mistakes and learn from one another. May we remember as we navigate the waters ahead that love covers a multitude of sin. And so let us determine even now that we're going to love one another. May we embrace the best of our history and build upon the good foundations constructed by brave builders who've gone before us. We recognize those who pioneered the way before us and who have set examples for us. And so it is I'm reminded of a story I heard a few years ago. It was a bright Saturday afternoon in April 1922 in the Briary Farming Community near Rosebud, Texas. Children were walking home from choir practice. One girl, without looking, carefully stepped into the road, directly into the path of a horse-drawn buggy. She jumped back to avoid an impact. The driver swerved. She was unhurt, but her dress was splashed with mud. When the driver, an African-American man, saw that she was fine, he continued on his way. The girl's older brother was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Filled with hate and desire for vengeance, he notified the others. The story was exaggerated, and more and more at each retelling, and a lynch mob was formed. They armed themselves, secured a rope, and headed for the farm cabin of the man who drove the buggy. Someone called the deputy sheriff, and he wasn't at home. His son, a 19-year-old ministry student at Baylor, took down the information. Knowing he would never be able to reach his father or others in time, he decided to act alone to try to save an innocent man's life. He grabbed his father's Winchester and galloped bareback, bareback to the man's cabin. As he was knocking on the door, the clan arrived, over 20 of them armed with pistols and shotguns and a rope. The young man, all five foot seven of him, turned and stared into the face of evil. He likely knew most of them, but he couldn't see their faces. Step aside, boy, the leader said. Thinking very quickly, the young man said, in my father's absence, I'm acting as an assistant deputy sheriff. I've come to arrest this man and take him into custody. They responded, he's already been tried and convicted. Step aside. This was it, the moment of truth, the crucible. The event that defines a life one way or the other. Holding his rifle steady and staring at directly at them, the young man who wanted to be a pastor someday said, you'll have to kill me first. There was no sound, no one spoke. Then the young man took off his hat and he said, I can only think of one thing to do and that's to pray to God for guidance and strength. And he bowed his head and began to pray. It caught the men off guard. They all claimed to be Christians themselves and so they had no choice but to bow and pray with them. 
No one knows the words of his prayer. But when the young man finished, he pulled the buggy driver up onto his horse, and the two of them rode right through the middle of the crowd onto the young man's home. The buggy rider, of course, was never charged. The young man and his father, when his father, the sheriff, returned home, made sure that the community knew he was completely innocent. That young man's name was John Wesley Rayleigh, whose statue most of you walked by coming into the chapel this morning that bears his name. His grandson shared the story with me the day we dedicated the statue of his grandfather who served as president here for 27 years. I think often that 19 year old five foot seven kid and in the context of our message today let me just say may we have the courage to forge ahead boldly in tearing down old walls that separate us building new structures that unite us and may we do so with great love for one another following in the footsteps of Rayleigh, Mays, Fadulu, and others who dared to be different, who dared to be good. May we seek and may God grant that we should find Shalom. Thank you.